Welcome to the next episode of the Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. This week we're going to talk about the opposite of last week. Mm-hmm. Last time we talked about when the adrenal glands get overactive. This time we're going to talk about what happens when the adrenal glands stop producing the hormones they're mm-hmm. supposed to. This is called Addison's disease. It's, it happens in people, dogs. It happens very rarely in cats. So if we do see it in cats, it's going to be one of those things, those unicorns that you see every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, we talked a little bit about the adrenal glands last time. They're located just in front of the kidneys. They actually have a, a medulla and a cortex like the kidneys do. The medulla is the part where it actually produces epinephrine, your adrenaline. Oh. So you think adrenaline, adrenal, that's where the name comes from. Okay. The cortex is going to be where we have the sex hormones, the mineralocorticoids, which regulate the sodium, potassium, and the glucocorticoids that regulate blood sugar and also metabolism of protein and fat. So when we see uh, a failure of the adrenal glands where they're not producing enough, it's usually primary. It's usually the adrenal glands stop working. And you have to lose about 85% of your adrenal glands before it will show up on the tests. Mm. So it always affects both uh, adrenal glands. We can also see it secondarily to either a defect in the hypothalamus, which, ca- which releases a hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone. Um, and that uh, stimulates the pituitary to produce the ACTH we talked about last time, the adrenocorticotropic hormone. When we do see um, just a secondary where that is affected by those, the mineralocorticoid part that affects the sodium potassium is not affected. We just see the glucocorticoids going low. And that makes the dogs much more susceptible to stress because cortisol is a stress hormone. Mm -hmm. So we say glucocorticoids and cortisol are kind of interchangeable. Mineralocorticoids are the diversion that affects sodium potassium levels. And we do see this disease more often in some breeds. Um, in uh, several of the breeds, it actually has a, a known genetic basis. So in the standard poodle, the Portuguese water dog, the bearded collie, and the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. Wow, that's a mouthful. I have not seen one of those. I don't know what that is. The other dogs we see it in quite often are the West Highland White Terriers. Whenever I see a little white dog, I'm always thinking, does it have Addison's? Mm-hmm. The soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, Rottweiler, mm-hmm. Great Dane, the Leonberger, wow. the Great Pyrenees, Pomeranian, <laughs> King Terrier, and the Cocker Spaniel. Hmm. Usually it's going to affect dogs less than seven years of age, and 70% of the cases are going to be females. Hmm. So they, they say even though these breeds are more represented, you, you can see it in almost any female dog of any breed. So the more specifically, when we talk about what these hormones do, the glucocorticoids are going to be stimulating production of glucose in the liver. They enhance the breakdown of fat and protein. Uh, and they maintain blood pressure. Okay. And they have other metabolic functions that they do, but those are the main ones. The mineralocorticoids, they're going to increase sodium absorption and potassium secretion. Okay. So when those are missing, we'll see the sodium start to go down and the potassium start to go up. And it can do this through the kidneys, the sweat glands, salivary glands, and even the intestines. Mm. The symptoms that we're going to see, like a lot of these hormonal problems, is increased drinking, yeah. increased urination. But it, this can uh, come in an acute crisis form. And when that happens, they're going to come in really, really sick. Mm-hmm. Um, more often, we'll see them in sort of a waxing and waning thing where the dogs have episodes of symptoms, typically vomiting and diarrhea. In the acute ones, they're going to come in usually collapsed. Yeah. Their heart rate's going to be very low. They're going to be dehydrated. Mm-hmm. Because they have very high potassium, their pulse is going to get very low. In the chronic symptoms, usually we'll, they'll come in and say, oh, he's been more tired than usual, been a little bit weak. We've been seeing episodes of diarrhea and vomiting. The appetite's been decreased. Shaking is a, a very common symptom, too. A little shaking white dog. Uh, Westy, I'm going to think immediately of Addison's disease. Hmm. Weight loss. Abdominal pain can be associated okay. with this. Uh, and then if we listen to them, I've had dogs come in with a heart rate of 40. Hmm. And that's very typical of uh, uh, starting to go into an Addisonian crisis. The thing about Addison's is it can mimic a lot of other diseases. So yeah. we need to distinguish this from a primary gastrointestinal problem because you can uh, have potassium, lose sodium from gastrointestinal disease. Um, pancreatitis, intoxication. So oh. drugs, alcohol can produce symptoms very similar to that. And kidney and liver disease can look exactly like it on, on an exam as well. Mm. Um, I remember one of the uh, doctors said that, you know, you're probably going to see a lot more Addison's than you're going to diagnose. Yeah. Because a lot of these uh, waxing and waning ones, they get better. 
And you think, oh, mm. what I treated him for is working. Sometimes part of your treatment is to give him a little bit of steroids, and the steroids mm -hmm. do make him feel better, but yeah. you've not gotten the diagnosis. So it tends to go underdiagnosed uh, chronically, so it's something that we're always going to look for. It does require some more specific testing in some cases. So last time we talked about in uh, Cushing's, we get this called stress leukogram, where we have the high cortisol induces a certain change in the white blood cells. In Addison's, it's the opposite. So it's called a reverse stress leukogram. That's huh. pretty original, I guess. <laughs> so we'll see a decrease in the neutrophils, which are the pus cells we talked about, an increase in the lymphocytes that produce the antibodies and the eosinophils that are associated with parasites and allergies. We also can see a myelinemia. And anemia occurs in a lot of chronic diseases, so mm -hmm. it may not be very specific to that, but that's not unusual to see that. On the blood chemistry, the typical thing is that decreased sodium and elevated potassium. Mm -hmm. So we're usually doing a ratio of the two. If it's less than 27, we're going to think, okay, we need to look a little bit closer on that. We'll sometimes also see increases in the calcium or decreases in the glucose, the blood sugar, albumin, which is a protein produced in the liver, cholesterol. And then we still see what's called azotemia, where the BUN and creatinine that are normally excreted by the kidneys can be elevated. And that's usually from the dehydration. X-rays uh, will oftentimes see, uh, if you do a chest X-ray, a smaller than normal heart. Hmm. Very typical Addison's that their heart looks a little smaller. And you can even see a decrease in size in the blood vessels, the pulmonary blood vessels, and the veins coming into the, the chest. The caudal vena cave is the big vein that comes from the body. Oh. So that's a, an interesting uh, x-ray change that you might see. On the EKG, the potassium causes very distinct changes in the electrocardiogram. Hmm. So we'll see that prolonged interval between beats. We'll see um, exact... Uh, exacerbation of the T waves, which are the relaxation phase of the ventricles, and decreasing of the P waves. And sometimes the P waves disappear. P waves are when the atria contract, the smaller chambers in the upper part of the heart. So the diagnosis is going to be very similar to uh, the Cushing's disease. We're going to be looking at adrenal function. And the, the best test to do for this is the ACTH stimulation yes. test. So mm -hmm. we're going to give them the hormone that normally would stimulate the glands, if they don't stimulate, we've kind of got our diagnosis. You can use the urine creatinine uh, cortisol ratio as a preliminary test. Um, it's actually very sensitive and very specific, and they've recently been doing a study to see if that might be a, a diagnostic test as well. Hmm. Um, when we have them come in where for uh, treatment, we're going to do fluid therapy if it's an acute crisis. Mm -hmm. We need to get those sodium levels back up and the potassium levels down. The thing is, we don't want to do it too quickly. Yeah. If you do it you know, over a few hours, you're going to actually cause neurologic symptoms because of that sudden spike in the sodium. Mm -hmm. So we want the sodium to go up a little bit by little bit uh, over time, and to get the potassium will come down once you start doing that. Uh, we used to say, you know, do sodium chloride as a fluid. Right now they're saying just any balanced electrolyte solution is better than that. Mm -hmm. Getting them a steroid yeah. uh, treatment because we want to get them on steroids, but we're going to be using a lot lower dose than we would normally use for treating inflammation. Mm -hmm. The dose for treating for maintenance is about a tenth of what we would do for an anti-inflammatory dose. Mm -hmm. We'll also want to start getting a mineralocorticoid supplementation, especially if it's a primary disease. So there's two forms of that. Um, the one we use more, most often is the once a month injectable. Um, there's two brands of that, Percortin and Zycortal. Zycortal is a little cheaper. Not a lot cheaper, I wish it were. But <laughs> And then there's an oral form called Floronef, which is a daily pill that they take. Mm. The Floronef actually also has some glucocorticoid properties too, so sometimes that's the only supplement you need to do. Mm. There has been reports too when I was researching this of some dogs actually being able to, um, with the Percortin, go out up to 90 days between shots. Really? They were getting a, a mean of 35 days, which is pretty good. But what you have to do when you're treating, and we'll talk about this when we get the treatment here in a little bit, but you just have to watch their sodium potassium levels and their clinical signs. So we're going to be monitoring the sodium potassium very often. Usually the first um, two years we're going to do in every three months. It can take over a year to get them balance to yeah. where we want them to be. And then every six months is fine for that. Uh, it's rare that we get the sodium potassium ratio down to normal just using the Floronef, but clinically they act fine. So we go with that. <laughs> when, we're, uh, when we're doing this monitoring, what, what we're trying to do is if they're on the once a month 
if they're doing fine on once a month, uh, like so we usually do it 28 days. We'll go and go 29 days to the next one, and then 30 days, and just gradually keep extending that out until you get to a point where, if it goes too long, they start having symptoms again. Mm-hmm. That's pretty easy to do uh, on a stepwise basis. And they're getting a oral prednisone supplement every day as well. And again, mm-hmm. it's usually a very tiny amount. Um, I have a 50-pound dog. It gets uh, two and a half milligrams a day, which is you know, yeah, like, like salt on your popcorn. Yeah, Not going to do too much. The big limiting factor on this is if you got a big dog like a Great Pyrenees or a Great Dane, it's mm-hmm. going to be expensive. They're going to be using a whole bottle of the Zycortal a month, which is about three to $400. Yeah. Uh, smaller dogs, you can get two treatments per bottle. Um, really tiny dogs, you probably get five to ten treatments per bottle. We actually have a Italian Greyhound. She can, she's gone almost a full year on one bottle. Yeah. She gets such a but tiny the, dose. the treatment's going to be lifelong. This mm-hmm. is uh, something that does not recover or respond regular, um, after treatment. So it's something that they just have to, to manage going forward. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of education of the owners involved, letting them know what to look for. Uh, and making sure they have, you know, the prednisone, they don't run out of that. Yes. And whenever the dog gets stressed, their adrenal glands can't react to the stress as normal. So if they're really stressed, you might give them a little bit extra prednisone just to cover that for them. And if they start to have the symptoms, the sodium, the shaking, the vomiting, the diarrhea, we're going to want to check those sodium potassium levels and see how things are going. Making sure they're, you know, giving them medication properly, because usually this is an injection people learn to do at home, too. Mm. If they're doing it at home, making sure they're mixing the medication right and they're injecting it in the right spot so yeah. it gets absorbed properly. So if you are got one of those breeds that are very susceptible and they've got these symptoms, this is certainly something we want to look for, mm-hmm. especially if they're just having vomiting, diarrhea. We're going to always keep that in the back of our mind that Addison's is a potential diagnosis there. Yeah. All right, we're ready to move on to pet health news? Yeah. I got a really cool story here. This is really <laughs> neat. So... Um, you know, we got the microchips, which are a way for people to tr- track the animals if they get um, lost. All the shelters, scanners, right. uh, animal control have these. This one company called Finding Rover has come up with an app that tracks pets by their faces. It uses facial recognition software. Huh. So believe it or not, the app is sensitive enough to determine the differences in facial characteristics in dogs wow. to identify them. And when you think about it, we've got... To us, our faces look a lot different. To dogs, their faces probably look just as different as our faces look yeah. at us. So to the camera, it doesn't care if it's a dog or person. It's still going to be able to pick up those differences. Mm. So the, one of the neat things that they do is the app actually has a little button. When you're trying to take their picture, it barks. So the dog will look at the camera, and you get a really good picture. <laughs> So when you uh, find a lost pet, you can actually take their picture and upload it to their uh, database, and they'll, if they find a match, they'll get you in touch with the guardian of that pet. Wow. Or if you lose your pet, you can put their, your, you should have your picture already loaded up, and you just let them know, and they'll start looking for it. Hmm. So um, it doesn't replace microchips, but it's certainly a, a good augmentation to it, and if you don't have a microchip or the people, you know, you, if you find a dog on the street, you don't have a scanner. Right. You can use this to, to put them into the database and go. So I would recommend people get this Finding Rover app. Yeah. Um, get, take a picture of your dog and upload it and see how it goes. Uh, it's something that I think would really be helpful. That's but cool. I, it's just a weird way of using technology. And it only works on dogs, not cats yet? They don't have it for cats. It's Finding Rover, not Finding... Uh, fluffy. Know, we'll fluffy. <laughs> finding, uh, yeah. All right. We got a new product announcement to make. Um, there's a whole bunch of the oral flea and tick pills, but there's not mm-hmm. been oral flea and tick pills for cats. Yeah. Now Cordelio cat is out from Milanco. Mm. So they just got approval from the FDA last month. Um, there's going to be uh, just for approved for, for killing uh, adult fleas and prevention of flea infestation. So it doesn't do anything with ticks or the other parasites. It's by prescription only and has to be given with food. A lot of these medicines are best given with food. Okay. Two sizes, one for cats less than 4 pounds, one for cats 4 to 17 pounds. So if you have, like, those big main coons or Norwegian You may have to give them two pills. Okay. Yeah. The uh, most common adverse reactions, and this sounds like just a normal drug commercial that you get <laughs> when you're watching TV, <laughs> but weight loss, increased breathing, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased appetite, Elevated blood urea nitrogen, which just indicates dehydration. Mm-hmm. So those means those are symptoms reported during their trials. It doesn't necessarily mean the drug is causing it, just that it's, they have to put it on the label. They've been using it in Europe for a year. So they, if they would have had problems, we would have known by now. Yeah. And it's part of this class of drugs called isoxazolines. Uh, isoxazolines. <laughs> I'll cut out that part. Maybe I won't. <laughs> and this is the, the latest ones that have come out. This is your uh, Brevecto 
your Nexgard, your Semperica, mm -hmm. they're all this class of drug. And they target the flea's nervous system. And last, or 2018, the FDA actually put out a warning because they were worried that some animals were having neurologic symptoms themselves. Uh -oh. So they said, basically, if your pet is susceptible to seizures, you may want to pick a different type of flea preventative. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of evidence that they are the cause of it, but just to be safe, that's their current recommendation. Okay. So they don't say when it's going to be available, but if we have more information, we'll pass that on. But it's kind of neat. Cats usually don't take oral things, but apparently this is a very tasty say, thing. Is it like a flavor treat or catnip oh, treat? Yeah, or? A, it would be nice if it was catnip, but apparently the cats in Europe like it, so maybe it's got cheap French cheese or something <laughs> in there. Okay. Um, this next story is from Veterinary Medicine Magazine, and it's basically, I, I like it because it's a review of some of the things that can cause damage to your pet's kidneys. Mm -hmm. And there are things you may not think of yeah. and you need to be aware of because pets like to lick up anything and eat anything around your house. So mm -hmm. if you've got these products around, be careful with them. Um, if your dog, the first one is vitamin D, which is coli calciferol. And it's most commonly found in creams that are used to treat psoriasis in people. Uh -huh. So if the dog finds the tube of cream, bites into it, starts eating it, they can get a toxic dose of this vitamin D very quickly. Mm. It's also an ingredient in the uh, rodenticides, the rat poisons and mouse oh. poisons, So because it basically can cause uh, kidney failure in those animals. Wow. So typical symptoms you're going to see after ingestion are going to be vomiting, depression, increased drinking, increased urination about 12 to 18 hours later. And kidney failure can occur within 24 to 48 hours. Wow. So if we know they ate it recently, we're going to make them throw up. Mm -hmm. This is typical with a lot of things. We want to try and do it within the, the previous hour for the creams. If it's the rat poison, we got about four hours before it leaves the stomach that we can do that effectively. And then a single dose of activated charcoal to help absorb anything that might still be down the intestinal tract. And then we're going to just start them on a saline drip to help uh, increase their, um, help with the, any diluting their calcium that might be getting into their, their blood because of this, the kidney failure, and just help start flushing things through the kidney. Um, if the kidney, if the calcium values start going up, calcitonin is a drug that's recommended for that as well. But fluid therapy is always what we're going to do in these kidney failures. The kidney does have ability to regenerate and recover from some of these toxins. So uh -huh. the sooner we get them, the better. If it's at night, on the weekend, get them to the emergency clinic. It's going to save their life. Mm -hmm. Another common uh, kidney toxin is ethylene glycol. And this yeah. is what's found in antifreeze. Mm -hmm. Toxic doses have not been very well uh, studied. It seems to vary a lot between animals. But central nervous symptoms appear first, and then it leads to the, the neuro, uh, kidney failure, the kidney problems. So usually we'll see the um, increased drinking, increased um, urination, um, and a decrease in their body temperature within about the first half hour. Mm. Um, they can actually even develop cardiopulmonary signs within about 12 to 24 hours too, so difficulty breathing, um, heart irregularities, things like this. Mm. Kidney effects can be seen as early as 12 hours after ingestion, but more commonly at one to three days afterwards. Okay. And what we're going to see on the, the test is very typical. In their urine, we're going to see calcium oxalate crystals. Very common with this. The, the oxalate is a metabolite of the ethylene glycol, so it gets excreted to the kidneys and these crystals start to form. The, uh, they actually have some rapid diagnosis tests to make sure if your pet's been exposed to it. They're specific for cats and dogs. Uh, all the emergency clinics are going to have these. Uh, but if we know they've eaten them, we don't need to necessarily yeah. do that diagnostic test. But if you're not sure, bring them in and they can get that test done. Hmm. Treatment is typical with some of the other things, inducing the vomiting, sometimes flushing out their stomach. Activated charcoal doesn't have much of an effect, so we may not use that. Hmm. The um, high rates of fluids to just promote flushing through the kidneys is very uh, important as well. And then treatment with ethanol, which is alcohol. Mm -hmm. In fact, they used to, like, in the old days, give IV vodka to these dogs to help oh. counteract the effects, and that works. Mm. Uh, fomeprazole is another medication that helps uh, with the breakdown of the ethylene glycol into uh, uh, its uh, metabolites. So... If your vet says, well, we need to get your dog uh, all darkened up to treat them, then that's actually the treatment. <laughs> yes. So. Again, that is by your vet. That doesn't mean give I, your pet a shot of vodka no, at home. Don't do don't that. Don't do no, that. No. Because that will make them vomit even Much more. Much worse. So it has to be given IV, and there's a specific dose we give. So, mm -hmm. All right. Um, NSAIDs, which we talked last time about that cream, that hand cream that was affecting the cats that yes. were licking people. But any of the non steroidal anti inflammatories can be kidney damage to the kidneys in dogs and cats. 
So things like ibuprofen, um, Aleve, acetaminophen, aspirin, mm-hmm. all of those uh, meloxicam, even though we'll use that in dogs, when you get the people ones and they get a high dose of them, it can be very irritating to the kidneys. Vomiting and diarrhea is very typical symptoms we'll see initially, but it can can uh, cause very severe damage to the kidneys, especially if they've already got some pre-existing uh, problems there. Yeah. So again, we're going to make them vomit if, if we think that's suspected and get the activated charcoal in and then hit them with the fluids. In terms of plants, the most toxic kidney to the plants are lilies. Yes. All right. So coming up on Easter here, that's something that we're going to be warning people about again. Mm-hmm. But lilies uh, cause very acute renal failure in cats. The mechanism is unknown. They don't know no. why it kills their kidneys. Uh, vomiting usually is the first clinical symptom, and that can occur within a few hours of ingestion. But the mm-hmm. kidney failure occurs about one to three days afterwards. Um, within 24 hours, we can see changes in the blood work and the urine. So those are things mm-hmm. we're going to be watching for. Toxicity is often fatal in this, yes. especially if they're not caught within the first 18 hours. And a lot of times you don't know. Yeah. Because some of these symptoms may not show up for a day. Mm-hmm. For cases involving renal failure, they've had, say, some cats with dialysis, but it's it can take a long time for that yeah. to happen. And then the big one, and this is one that wasn't even a concern 30 years ago when I was in vet school, is the grapes and raisins. Yeah, isn't there still, like, a lot of controversy with this? Well, it's not so much controversy, but there's a wide variety of responses in the pets to the grapes and raisins. Yeah. So, again, the, they don't know what the toxic dose is, and it varies between animals. One animal got really sick from one grape. Other dogs have been eating raisins all their whole life and never gotten symptoms. Well, and that was like my uncle's dog. He had a 19-year-old Cocker Spaniel. From the day he got that puppy at six weeks, they always ate green grapes together. Yeah. Every morning, green grapes. And he lived in 19. So there's probably some uh, metabolic hormone or enzyme they're missing that it makes the, the toxic factor more susceptible. So I think there's a, a population of dogs that just are missing an enzyme that yeah. metabolizes that, and that's why it's more toxic for them. So treatment is just like with any of the other things. We're going to do IV fluids, Mm -hmm. symptomatic care, uh, getting them to vomit if they've just eaten them recently to prevent problems. We've I've had so many animals that the owners have give the dog got into raisins or grapes. We say, well, let's do a blood panel. We'll check them again a few days later. Everything looks good. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. But then you do see the some dogs that they they get into an oatmeal raisin cookie and then they're sick and they're dying from kidney Mm -hmm. failure. So be aware of those things. Watch those things. If your dog gets into something and you're not sure, or you Google it and it says this is dangerous, get them to your vet immediately. Time is of the essence with these things. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's something they ate, the sooner we can get it out of their gastrointestinal tract, the better. Yep. All right. We're going to move on to our case of the week. And this is a little bit related to eating things that they shouldn't. (laughs) Um, So this was a dog. His name is Pear, and he was not feeling too well. And Pear's about 13 years old, oh. and his owners have always fed him almonds and cashews. Huh. Now, almonds and cashews are generally safe for dogs. Oh, okay. There's nothing toxic in there that's going to be a problem, but like most nuts, they have a high degree of fat. Mm. And when we talked about pancreatitis, and these older dogs, they get a high fatty meal, that can cause them to go into pancreatitis. So that's kind of what happened with Pear. Oh. His body just can't handle the high fat anymore. <laughs> so... Uh, we, we sent off some blood work. We're going to wait for the confirmation on that. But he was kind of painful in his abdomen. He was a little yeah. bit dehydrated, so we kind of treated him symptomatically. And that was the only thing really that was a little bit different. He probably hadn't had them for a while. But they're very high in fat. Mm. And if you uh, feed your dog a lot of those, and maybe you leave them out in a bowl and they eat a bunch and you weren't aware of how much they ate, uh. um, that can be a problem for them. There are some nuts that you do have to avoid in dogs. When mm-hmm. I was doing my research on this, macadamia nuts yeah, very bad. and black walnuts. Huh. So don't give those to your pets. Peanuts, peanut especially peanut. unsalted peanuts are fine. Yeah. Peanut butter, you got to be careful because some of the peanut butter has got the xylitol in it. Yeah. So always make sure you use, if you're using, and peanut butter is great for training them and giving them medications. Mm-hmm. Make sure your peanut butter doesn't have xylitol in it. If it yeah. does, take it back and get something else. All right, now we're going to move on to your favorite part, tech yep, tips. tech tips. So this is um, something I wanted to talk about because it's getting colder. Mm-hmm. The, it's not only getting cold, but the snow on the ground, the salt that people put on their sidewalks. Yep. So what are things that people can do to help protect their dog's feet? You think, oh, dog's feet, they're, they got these pads, they can yep. handle this stuff. But a lot of them, it's 
it's really tough on them. Oh yeah, a lot of people don't think that a lot of dogs do have sensitive paw pads, and you have to think, yes, these animals are their ancestors were the great wolves in the forest, but they're not out there. They're not scrounging for their food. They're not running around on hot concrete every day. Not Most, building up the like, calluses. Yeah, they're not building up these calluses, yeah. and you have to think a lot of these dogs get, especially smaller ones, they get carried everywhere, right. so they have baby soft paws, and you put them on the ground, and now you have salt that's eating away at their paw, or this really really cold snow or hot concrete sometimes right. um these are things you know most people don't think about um so there are a lot of options to help their balls they do have uh doggy booties i know <laughs> i saw those the other day and that's one of the things that made me think about uh -huh. this They're and they so have cute. so many different brands and styles and they have doggy booties that are just like people booties that are like fleece lined they have buttons nice. and zippers you can match an outfit with them um and then you have some that are like rubber um, that can just easily slide over their paw and you know when you're getting these uh, booties a lot of them so you have to think of your pet's lifestyle or how easy it is to get things on or off of their paws um, so if your pet doesn't like their paw being touched you know you wouldn't want to take time of getting the fleece line that you have to zip up and wrap up right. um, but these things are out there and then like they do have like disposable booties that you could put on once and then just toss them out when you're done that sounds Kind of easy. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty easy, and um, most owners say they're they're kind of like a balloon, where they like they slide kind of slide on the dog's paw. They kind of fit around the so they paw. Kind of snug around. Like yeah, like pretty rubber. snug, and they make it a little easier for the dogs because yes, they're a little um, restraint, but they feel more flexible. Okay. Whereas you have you know so the more natural to the dog. Mm hmm. Okay. But they're a little different than like the firmer booties where that's it. You put your dog's paw on it, and they can't really get around anywhere else. Um, and then they have, um, doggy, like, I don't know, they're like these little sticky pad things. You put them on the pads of your dog's paw. Oh. And so you can buy them online and you'll literally get, uh, one paw piece is four pieces because you put it on the big pad and yeah. then the four toes around. Right. And so what it does is it sticks to the dog's paw and so when they go outside this is a better way because your dog's not as interested with the booty and they can walk in is water resistant so you don't have to worry about the snow or the water so melting like into it kind of yeah it's like <laughs> horseshoes you're that you're not them nailing them in they, they stick to yeah. it um to me it um, it almost reminds me of like a command strip okay. like you put it on the wall and then when you pull it off there's no damage or anything the dog doesn't seem bothered by it um a lot of people would really dogs with really fluffy paws um, seem to like it because you know it just sticks onto the pad and the fur, so okay. they don't have to worry about the salt getting the salt getting in between their toes and stuck into the fur. Right. Um, because that's a lot of things with these big fluffy Newfie Saint Bernards, even some of these labs, mm -hmm. they have all that fur in between there, and people don't think that that salt just keeps building up, building up, yeah. and is going to start causing damage eventually. Right. So they're gonna. So if they're not gonna wear boots, we do have to protect them against mm -hmm. uh, against take care of the salt. It'll yes. Build up if something. We don't. Yes. Um, and then one of the last things, which most people do seem to like, is uh, there's a wax. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think we talked about this before I, with, yeah. with something else. Yeah, Yeah. so there um, you can, it's a DIY thing. You can even find it online. You can find it at pet, pet stores. It's almost like a... Um, it's almost like a lip gloss right. where you can just open a container, get a thin layer and rub it on the pads of your dog's paws. Right. Um, but the thing with, about that is, you know... It still doesn't get into the fur so like if they're walking so yes their pads are uh, protected now right. but like again if you're walking with salt or they're going through the burrs or things like that they're still going to get in between the pads yeah and then so like salt and things are still going to get in there um i mean if you go home and you rinse your dog's paws off very well that works too but a lot of time the wax you don't have to worry about getting off okay. um, because it's just going to naturally start washing off with all the salt Ooh. and the snow right um, so there are a lot of options out there. Uh, my personal favorite is the booties, yeah. just because I think they're adorable. Yeah, if you can get your dog to wear them, they're adorable, and they can go with your outfit. Um, mm. I think I said this before when we talked about booties. Um, you always want to make sure you get your dog used to wearing them. Yes. Um, they always said, you know, don't just put on all four booties at once because your dog's not going to move. Um, you do want to try to put them on, you know, at an angle so they can have a uh, a foot in the front and the back that they're ah, comfortable okay. on. So if you're going to put it on so your you front, put left, front left, back right. they put it on the back right. Yeah, that so now sense. your dogs are kind of getting used to it, and then they still have their other two paws that feel normal. Feel normal. 
Um, and, you know, again, just get him used to walking around the house with them before you even take him outside because you don't nice. want to have to drag your 80-pound dog down the street because <laughs> he doesn't want to walk in boots. Um, but, yeah, there are a lot of different brands, a lot of different types. There are a lot of things out there that people, you know, are coming up with more things mm-hmm. every day and more yes. um, things just to help. But, you know, biggest thing is just figuring out your lifestyle, your pet, and what's right. good for them, what works. And then I think people need to also be aware that the uh, – the walking on ice that can be really sharp. They mm-hmm. can cut their feet. Even the big grains of, of salt can be very irritating and, yeah. and cause punctures. And if it's really cold, they can get frostbite on yeah. their feet. There are, especially if they're standing, they get their feet get wet or they're getting some slush and they mm-hmm. get really cold that way. So when it's really, really cold, we're going to want to limit their time outside, but yes. definitely try and get them used to those boots. Mm-hmm. And if you think your pet um, has some irritation or they get a cut in their pad, bring them in so yes. we can get that taken care of and get that treated because it's just going to get worse. If they mm-hmm. get more salt in there, it's just going to be stinging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most miserable. people think a little cut is nothing like a paper cut, but you'd be surprised how many paw pads we have to suture up yeah. around the winter time because it's I just see sliced. a lot of them get torn, too, mm-hmm. and, and that can make it hard for them to walk for a while, in which case yeah. the boot would be very nice. All right, great tips. Yep. All right, so uh, if you have uh, ideas of what to, or want some ideas what to get for to cover your dog's feet, ask your vet tech, ask your vet. Go to the pet stores, try different things on your dog. Bring mm-hmm. them with, see what they seem to be most comfortable with. And like Brittany said, get them used to it slowly. Yes. Get them used to it in the house first. All right, that's going to be it for this week. Mm-hmm. Next week, we're going to talk about a condition that we see fairly often in cats. It's called hepatic lipidosis. Yeah. And this is where their liver swells from uh, fat in their being metabolized in their body and it's something that uh, can be quite deadly in cats so we want to do what we can to minimize that problem in them so we'll talk a little bit about what causes that and how we treat that so that's it for this week i'm dr jim hosek bye